Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Sherelle Nussbaum Beach keynote for the Learning 2.0 conference. Welcome, Cheryl. I'm, I'm excited to be here, Steve. Thanks. I'm really delighted you're here. This is the closing day, and you deserve a position of prominence. So we're really looking forward to hearing what you have to say today. Thanks to Follett and Intel for their support of the conference, their sponsorship of the conference, and thanks to Mighty Bell, Blackboard Collaborate, Taking It Global, EdWeb, and Edutopia for promotional support. Cheryl, um, I really want to give you some credit. I think that Connected Educator Month, even more than just the name, comes from the heart of your material, and so I want to celebrate you as well as give you an opportunity to talk about the things you're passionate about. So th thanks for all that you do. That's awesome. Thank you for saying that. I sure do appreciate it. So are we ready to go, Steve? We are ready to go. So I did want to um, give it right back at you. Uh, if you would join me in giving an applause to Steve Hargadon. He is an unsung hero that often uh, brings great people to the table and uh, does that uh, from a very strong place of humility. A lot of the big ideas that uh, Steve is responsible for, you would know that he's responsible for them. So if you're clicking on the hand to raise your hand, that's one way to clap. And uh, you are welcome to take that back down when you're when you're done clapping. You can just click right back on the hand. It'll take it back down. So I'm excited to be here. I hope that you're, you're excited to be here. Has this been a crazy month or what? Uh, today what I want to do is talk about connected learning, and I'm calling it uh, Connected Learning, a Collaborative Statement on Teaching and Learning in the Digital Age. And it's, uh, it's really a celebration of the connected learning that's been happening as a result of Connected Learner Month. And the way that I want to start today, if we could, is I want to find out who's in the room and find out a little bit about you. Now, before you start introducing yourself in chat, there's a couple things that I want you to know. First of all, I am a big fan of self-promotion. And let me clarify that statement when I say it, because I know some of you are gasping in your seats. But when I say that I'm a big fan of, of self-promotion, there's a blog post to, to uh, underscore what I'm saying. It's really an unselfish self-promotion. What I want you to do today when you introduce yourselves, and I, I want you to give us some pieces of your digital footprint. I want you to tell us a little bit about who you are, your Twitter name, your blog, any kind of space that you have as you're introducing yourself. And the reason for that is that I feel like if you have really great ideas, if you're doing things that's changing the world for kids, if you understand how to emancipate teachers and help them self-actualize, and you're writing about very interesting interesting things and you believe in what you're doing, then you owe it to us to promote. I dropped in on Angela Meyer's, um, Mayer's uh, keynote earlier today. And one of the things she said was, she said, you know, you, you owe the world to share your genius. So I want us to start out introducing ourselves. And I've put some props there. would love for you to put it in the, uh, the chat window. Where do you live? What do you do? And, and where do you do it? Are you a connected learner? So I want to know who's in the room. Do we have emergent connected learners or established connected learners? Be sure and share your Twitter name, you know, or another way to find you. And then I want you to make one strong statement or assertion that really supports your belief in connected learning. You know, maybe something like, I believe in connected learning because. So we're going to take a few minutes for you to do that. And while you're sharing your information, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. I'm also going to share some links because I believe in unselfish self-promotion. And uh, then we'll get started. So uh, where do you live? What do you do? Where do you do it? Are you a connected learner now? No, just interested and, and want to be. But or yeah, heck, yeah, I'm, I'm, you wouldn't believe. Google me. Uh, your Twitter name or some way to find you in a strong statement or assertion that you have about connected learning. What is it that you believe? And I'll let go of the mic for a minute. I'm going to put a couple links in the uh, chat myself, and uh, then we'll get started. All right, some amazing information coming through. I'm really excited. I hope for the sake of the recording that you will put, put the information in about yourself. And let us, uh, I promise to go back and follow you on Twitter and look at your uh, comments and your blogs because I'm interested in you and I'm interested. You know, if, I, if you're not Googleable, I can't find you and I want to be able to find you and learn from you. 
So let me tell you a little bit about me. For those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Cheryl Nussbaum Beach, and often when I say my name, especially in online environments or on the phone, people will often think that I say I'm Cheryl from West Palm Beach. And uh, to make things a little bit more confusing, I'm not. I'm uh, Cheryl from Virginia Beach, so if that doesn't make things interesting. But I will tell you this, um, I had never met my father, and uh, I decided to uh, get in to find him and to look for him. And one day what I did is I found him, and guess where he lived? He, he has passed on now, but he lived in West Palm Beach. So in some ways, I am Cheryl from West Palm Beach, which makes it sort of interesting. I wanted to pull up the camera and just say hello to you. I don't know that I'll keep it on the whole time. I might pull it up and take it down. But I did uh, want to give you a chance to see me in case you haven't. I didn't want to keep it up the full time because it's kind of distracting. And really and truly, today's keynote isn't about me. It's about us. It's about we. It's about the collective us. So let me cut this off. And uh, that, keep introducing yourself in the window. I love the things that you're sharing. So I am the co-founder and CEO of Powerful Learning Practice. Um, click on the smiley face. It's underneath your picture. It has this little smiley face there. If you have heard of a Powerful Learning Practice or you know a little bit about it, I would love to know who's in the room that knows Powerful Learning Practice. But Powerful Learning Practice is basically a um, professional development company for 21st century educators. I also um, am a Twitterer and would love to follow you and have you follow me on Twitter so we can learn from each other there. And I put my link inside the uh, chat window. So that's just a little bit about me. Powerful Learning Practice, my company, has actually been one of the uh, workers behind the scene people with Steve Hargadon and what he's doing with Classroom 2.0 and others uh, in bringing you Connected Educator Month. Um, if you're not familiar with Connected Educator Month, then you probably are just new to Connected Education. But Connected Educator Month is, is a month-long celebration of becoming connected. It actually was uh, the brainchild and the idea of the U.S. Department of Education and others. Um, I have been thrilled. Uh, in the beginning, I was cautious because, uh, you know, working with a large organization or bureaucracy, uh, can be a scary thing. I thought that they would try to take control and that they wouldn't honor the people out here that have been connected for quite some time, and it was not the case. Uh, they very much have been supportive, in my opinion, and honoring folks that uh, that are new to connected education, that are, are seasoned connected educators, and so uh, they've been doing things all month long. It's my understanding that next month they'll really be working through the archives and finding ways to share everything. Uh, part of what I was tasked with, powerful learning practice, uh, there were several things, but one of the things that I'm most proud of is my organization created this starter kit. I just put the link in there for you. It's actually 31 days of connected goodness, and we really designed it uh, with newbies in mind. So we would love for you to um, share that with somebody who's new to connected education. It's a downloadable. Uh, each day it gives you lots of different options. You'll see a lot of your friends in there. It's, uh, it's pretty much a shared kind of experience with people all over the world. So um, I hope that you'll take a few minutes to, uh, to check that out. The other thing before we get started that I wanted to tell you about was um, Powerful Learning Practice is actually uh, putting on a conference called PLP Live. It's the end of September, and if you're a connected educator and you're interested in learning uh, in a way that, in a conference that's very conducive to connected education, then you're going to want to be a part of this. Um, one of the things that we're doing is we have some keynotes. They're going to be in the morning. It's going to be very TED-like, so it'll be fast and crazy. So that's kind of cool. And then the afternoon is all workshops. It's not breakouts, very cold and sensitive. I don't know who you are, breakout. Instead, it's four strands, four workshop strands that's led by seasoned facilitators where we will co-construct. We will collaboratively create things around four different uh, themes. The other thing that I think is important for you to look at um, with PLP Live is look at the faces. Um, just guys, just deal with me for just a second. I love men. I think men are a necessary part of the conversation. I think we need gender balance. But typically, when you look at an ed tech conference, it's all guys. You don't really see female keynoters. You'll see female workshoppers. So I want you to notice We've got some strong female voices who are going to provide some great gender equity. Uh, somebody said you've got some new names. These are new names, but you are going to be blown away by some of the things that they're going to share. 
For instance, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Quest to Learn, which is the high school in uh, New York that's all gaming. Uh, Eliza is actually the curriculum director for that school, and she's going to bring a strong message. So um, I do want to uh, encourage you. Uh, Renee Moore really looks at marginalized populations, and she works, at, works with kids from low socioeconomic groups and really speaks uh, for people who sometimes who don't advocate for themselves. A lot of people know Jane and Susie. They're, they're the reinventing of uh, project-based learning. Uh, Jackie does a lot with flipped classrooms and mobile technology. And then you might know those three guys, too. They're pretty popular. And uh, John Seely Ground, of course, is our opening keynote, and I couldn't be a bigger fan. So I just want to encourage you to uh, check, check out the conference and uh, come over and play with us. It's, um, it's going to be a lot of fun. So our mantra for today uh, is, for this keynote, is that it's going to be a collaborative keynote. You know, we are stronger together than apart, and none of us is as smart, creative, good, or interesting as all of us. And I, I just, as we go through the keynote today and talk about connected learning, I want you to know that I really believe that. That is my daily mantra. That is my mission, if you will, that I believe that it's through collective wisdom, building collective intelligence over time, that we're really going to have um, the strongest kind of, of learning to take place. And, uh, you know, any one voice by itself isn't going to be as powerful or as knowledgeable if we're all together. So what I want to do today is I want to really build this kind of collective intelligence and uh, talk a little bit about what we know and what we want to know around this topic of connected learning and uh, really start to think about how can we redefine keynotes in the 21st century? If we're going to be doing uh, keynotes, it can't be the person up front at the top of the room, taught at the top of the list in a, in a webinar, doing all the talking. Because if that happens, then it's, it's a really 20th century construct. You know, I can remember when I was in the classroom or I was on stage in the 20th century, and I really thought it was rude when people weren't looking at me, when they were talking, when I was talking, if they were back channel chatting. But now, i got to tell you, I really think it's rude if I do all the talking, that how dare I, when there's so much uh, experience out there, so much schema, you bring so much to the table, and you have so much that you could teach me, that, um, that I, I would be rude to, to do that. So I think we need to redefine rude, and I just want to really encourage you to use your voice in the chat, and we'll have opportunities to grab the mic. I also want to uh, really encourage you to use the back channel chat. I do want to introduce Kristen Dodd. I brought her up to moderator status. Kristen works with me as the director of e-learning over at Powerful Learning Practice, and uh, she is going to help me moderate today. You'll see her and John Norton and other people that will be in the chat area, and uh, so I know they're going to be asking good questions, and they'll help me see if there's some things that we need to talk about that I miss um, in my attempts to multitask or to switch back and forth quickly. So I want to start out with this idea of what is a connected learner and what is connected learning. You know, I think it really starts more basic than that with us talking about what is learning. You know, how do you define learning? How, smile at me if you're a learner, if you consider yourself a learner, and you think, you know, you're not just a teacher, you're really a learner, you spend a lot of time learning. You can click on that smiley face right underneath your name, you'll see a smiley face there. So quite a few of you are smiling and consider yourself learners. So if you are a learner, and some of you are doing it in chat, I love that, you got to tell me, how do you define learning? And, and also, it, then when we add the word connected to it, does that change the term? So I want to do a collective wondering to start this keynote, and I, here's what a collective wondering is. I'm going to set the timer for two minutes. Two minutes goes by fast, so you got to get warm up your fingers and get ready to race. But what I want you to do in chat, none of us are going to talk, we're just going to chat for a minute. What do you wonder about connected learning? I want you to allow yourself to be really curious, just, you know, really go deep and, and be vulnerable and ask questions. How do you define it? How, do, how does how you define it influence your definition of it when you, when you run it through the lens of how you see learning? So I'm going to hush. I'm going to set the timer. And I would just really allow, like for you to allow yourself to be, a, uh, to be very, very curious and to wonder out loud in the chat, what is it that you wonder about connected learning? What is it you want to know? What is it that you do know, and how do you define it? And I'm going to be quiet. All right, I love it. You guys have been sharing some wonderful things. Who'd like to grab the mic and share their definition? How, well, how do you define learning? Let's start there. Who'd like to share? 
And if you don't mind, John Norton, I'm going to put you on the spot, but sometimes it really takes one person to get started with the mic, sort of grease the wheel. So if you're in the room, I'd like for you to uh, define learning. How do you define learning, John? Learning about uh, making connections is uh, a way of um, being able to uh, repeat and uh, Patterns. What, when we, we, we learn something, it allows us to actually see in our brains what isn't happening in front of us anymore. Uh, so it, it's, it really is about a mapping exercise that, that our, our internal uh, cognitive representation of something allows us to understand the world around us. That, that's the way I define learning, at a very basic kind of biological level. I love it. Excellent. Somebody else, how do you define learning? Or let's shift it to connected learning. If you had to give a definition to connected learning, what would it be, Valerie? And just to remind you to, to talk, all you have to do is click on the microphone, and then you can uh, share. Cheryl, sure, I was actually going to quickly share a definition of learning, and um, just to well, quickly, the idea that the world is constantly changing, so I want to learn, but also it's there's a timeless element. So I want to seek the timeless and the changing. All right, very powerful. Go ahead, Jay. Jay Comfort. So the way this works is two people at a time. I have it set up where two of us can talk. So you want to click on the microphone. When you click on the talk button right above your name, up there in the top left, you'll be able to grab the mic. So Jay Comfort, if you want to grab the mic, and then after that, Doyle. And then when you're not talking, you don't want to click on the mic. You don't want to have it active. Can you hear me now? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. So, Jay Comfort, did you want to share about learning or connected learning? Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, we, can, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, because you, I, I guess it's a delay because you asked me a question. Okay, I'll just, I'll just, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but to me, um, learning has been going on for as long as human beings are around, and it, a lot of it takes place in connections between human beings, between ideas. And uh, now we have technology that does it, but uh, people can just as easily learn from um, a great person that lived uh, a thousand years ago if it manages to uh, have uh, written down the communication somewhere. Um, and so I would like just to see it in a, in a historical perspective. And um, I, I am I'm really wary of all the, the religious overtones of the conversation about connected learning. So that's all I need to say. Thank you. Hi, Judy. Thank you for that. How about you, Rhonda? To me, I think I put in the chat meaningful or relevant or um, applicable maybe is even a better word. I, I don't mean to make it sound soft. I just mean to make it sound um, impactful that learning is uh, going on around me all the time, whether it's between myself and someone else or whether it's between others around me. And I think that anytime we can enhance that, it's a connection. Um, so. For me, learning and connected learning is about relevant and, as I use the word, meaningful or applicable learning, and it, and it doesn't necessarily have to come from one specific place or in one specific way. All right. Thank you very much for those of you that grabbed the mic and are willing to share. I know it takes, uh, sometimes it, it takes, part of connected learning is being willing to be transparent and to be bold and to take risks. And sometimes speaking out in a conference like this, especially when we know it to be an archive, is uh, sort of a risk-taking behavior. So I think we've really seen a shift. I think when we start to think about learning, while I do agree a lot with what John said at the beginning, that learning really is organic, that it has to do with, for me, the generalization of what you've learned. If you can take it into a new context, you've probably learned it. It doesn't have a lot to do with memorization. In fact, a good friend of mine, uh, Peter Skillen, is now kind of exploring this idea that it has more to do with mesmerization, being mesmerized and emotionally uh, impactful. 
I think that in the 21st century, what we're really seeing is a shift that we're moving to a do-it-yourself professional development or a do-it-yourself kind of learning. I think what these technologies have done is they provide amplification and allowed us to be able to find each other, to be able to learn from each other, to interact with each other. And I think we're even getting good at collaborating with each other. You know, a lot of people use the words cooperative and collaborative interchangeably. And I think once we take it to an online space, uh, we aren't just cooperating with each other anymore. We're actually starting to build things and find solutions and to, uh, to understand each other's culture from around the globe and to, uh, to really go out in a very purposeful way and harvest information and links and knowledge. And then I see it here in this sec and bring it back. Uh, to the classrooms, the schools, or the districts. So, Carolyn, what are you thinking? I'm I'm on my iPad. Can you hear me? We can. can and we're me? glad you're. We can. We're glad you're here. Thank you so much for that. Okay. Uh, I'd like to kind of um, make an association with the teacher book club that I belong to. I have um, read so many books that I would never have gravitated to. Uh, except for the fact that we chose them as a group. And I think the same thing with connected learning. My my areas of uh, concentration would have been so much narrower. But since I've been involved in a personal learning network, I have learned just so much and branched out to so many different areas. And I think that's another thing that connected learning is all about, is opening and expanding her horizons. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And it is an interesting kind of parallel, thinking that when you're in a book club, you know, books that you wouldn't have necessarily taken off the shelf come your way. And it is very similar uh, when we're thinking about the connected learning, that serendipitous chances for learning and for exploring ideas come our way about things we may not have even considered or we wouldn't have gone there on our own. So it, it, it does expand our horizons. I love this uh, information by David Wiley where he talks about that there's six trends for a digital age. You know, it's where we're seeing shifts from the things on the left to the things on the right. You know, he talks about that there's a real shift from analog kinds of experiences to very digital ones. And he, he talks about this idea that we used to be tethered to our machines, plugged in, and now we're using mobile devices. So many of you said you're on your iPad participating in this, or you're on your phone, or I've, I've had conversations with people on airplanes. And, and I, I got I to point out, I love what Sherry Turkle says, and it's down at the bottom of this. If you haven't read her book, Alone Together, I'd strongly recommend it. A lot of people that um, talk about that book think she must be techno-resistant or, you know, somebody who's against the technology technology movement, and it couldn't be uh, more false. She actually it comes out of MIT, her background is in robotics, but she is starting, instead of just taking a cheerleader approach or an evangelist approach with connected learning, she's starting to help us to think about some tough questions. And one of the things that she poses in the book is, you know, now that we're not tethered to our devices anymore, have we just replaced it and we're tethered to our mobile devices? And so you can think about the kids you know. You may be that, uh, that your smart device, your smartphone is actually an extension of your hands. Um, I have four kids. They're all in their 20s, and they all sleep with their phones. They're constantly by their side. Um, I'm fortunate enough that my phone won't get connectivity in my house. So uh, I never have my phone there unless I'm traveling. But when I'm traveling, it is an extension of myself. I, I thought I would start with something that I think is a key point when we're talking about connected learning and we're learning from each other, and it's this idea of the human network. Now, this little piece here, this little transcript that you're looking at was from a, a commercial that Cisco put out where it goes, you know, welcome to a brand new way, day, a brand new way of getting things done. And I love it. It's where you subscribe to people, not magazines, you know, where you can drag and drop people wherever you want to go. And I think the key thing that we hear here is that this is really about the human network, that these technologies, this connected learning, that the only role the technology plays in it is a portal to transport us or to translate us uh, wherever we want to go to be able to collaborate with people all around the world. It makes connecting easy. It makes us, uh, it makes us be able to um, talk to people and share ideas and to have those experiences as, uh, as, the speak as Rhonda or whoever it was that was speaking just a moment ago. I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. But she was sharing from the book club. It, it really is about the people and about the ideas 
and about what we can do with the technology more than it is the technology. So the crux of what I want to do today is around this document. Um, smile at me either in chat or in the, by clicking on the smiley face. Have you seen this document? Did you go to the Google Doc? Are you familiar with the collaborative uh, work we did on the Connected Learning Manifesto? Okay, so some of you are saying no, and I appreciate that. Uh, some of you are saying yes. So I put a Google link inside chat, and I would love it if you would go there. Uh, that is where we are creating a, con a connected learning manifesto. And what I did is I just originally put up a prompt that asked people, hey, let's, let's build this together. What are your strong assertions? What is it that, you're, that you believe about connected learning? What kinds of statements do you have to make in support of being a connected educator or a connected learner? And immediately, people started putting all kinds of just brilliant things up. So I took a quick swipe, and I made this document. Since I've made the document, people have gone in there, and other people have it spawned other people doing other things on other sites. But um, there has been a lot of great and collective intelligence that has been um, created. And so what I thought we would do is kind of go through some of these big ideas that surfaced out of the collaborative work on the Connected Learning Manifesto. So as we go through this, i got to tell you, most of these ideas are not going to be mine. They're going to be yours. They're going to be the other people that worked on this document. But we're going to deconstruct it a little bit. We're going to synthesize it. We're going to break it apart. So the first uh, precept that I want to talk about, or the first thing that came out of that manifesto, was be a learner first and an educator second. So be a, being connected is about the we and not the me. So if you look at some of these statements here, and when people put a, a Twitter name, I connected it to it, and some people just put, the, put it up. But it's all about asking hard questions and then listening deeply. So what does it mean to be a learner first and a teacher second? You know, I think we've come into an era of teaching and learning where we really don't want to teach kids. We don't want to teach each other. We just want to help each other learn. And that there's so many opportunities to learn anything, any place, any time we want to learn it. So one of, the, one of the things about connected education, I love what Barb English has said here. She said, a connected learner isn't afraid to admit that they don't know the answer to questions. So it's being very vulnerable, being very transparent, saying, let's talk about this. In fact, it's really a turnoff. Uh, for me, I don't know about you, and, I, and I'm going to ask you in just a second, um, when people come at this really acting like I'm here, I know all the answers, I've figured it all out. Because the real advantage of being part of a, a collaborative, a, a group of connected educators, is that we can ask these questions and we can learn from each other. Lisa Neal says, asking our questions out in the open in connected ways. So instead of pretending like we know and then asking questions to somebody behind the scenes, it's just saying out in the open, what do you guys think about this? Teach me. Help me learn. What does it mean to be a learner first and an educator second? It's willing to be transparent. It's also about reverse mentorship. It's about allowing those that are younger than us sometimes to uh, teach us. And going into the classroom and switching it from a classroom of learners to a, a community of learners is very powerful. It's one thing to do it with adults on Twitter and in blogs, and, you know, we can kind of do that. But when you go into the classroom, there's, it, the, traditionally we were supposed to be the knowledge giver. And so instead, to actually be a co-learner with your students can be kind of an interesting thing. And then also there's this idea of lurking. I think lurking is kind of a, an important thing to talk about. You know, I love what um, S.J. Hayes 8 has put here where it says lurkers become learners and learners become contributors. So in the beginning, you know, um, Dr. Winger talks about that lurking, and I see you soon. I'm going to give you the mic. I'd love to hear what you got to say. Dr. Winger talks about lurking, and he says that lurking is actually a legitimate periphery kind of response. It's where we um, watch, we want, like if you're going somewhere new, like to a ball game or a party or a new church or something like that, when you go uh, to whatever it is, knitting club, whatever it is that you're going to do, you tend to not do a lot of uh, talking and decision making in the beginning. You sort of lurk. You sort of get your bearings. You figure things out. But after a while, then you become a learner and a contributor. And uh, S.J. Hayes Aid is saying this is the way that it happens online, too. So, Sue, react to this a little bit. What do you think? Sue Goodrich, you want to grab the mic? I saw you raised your hand a minute ago. I'm sorry. I raised my hand by accident while exploring the, the um, iPad app. I'm happily listening, though. All right, wonderful. 
How about somebody else? Talk to me a little bit about this be, learn, be a learner first and an educator second. Does it speak to you? Do any of the things that are in on this slide speak to you? Judy? Uh, yes, this is Judy Comfort in Vancouver. I already typed my answer, and, and I don't want to beleaguer the point of, of us giving ourselves such credit in our new religion and everything, but good teachers have always listened to their students, and, um, and, and I think it's a kind of essential to the values of a a humanist democratic uh, classroom, and we've all had really, really good teachers, and all had really crappy teachers, um, and and the best ones are have all the qualities that you're describing as the the new thing. I think that your point earlier about that we can connect with like-minded people uh, around the world is huge, though. Um, so that's all. I need. Thanks, thanks for listening to me. Thank you so much for that. And you know, you you raised some great points there. You really do. So this idea of being able to be a co-learner with our students in the classroom, is it threatening to you? What do you think about that? And that's for anybody in the room. Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Sure can. Okay. I'm talking to you from Germany, and the other day I made a presentation on the same uh, subject, and my experience is that teachers are really being scared of losing control when they become a learner because they are not used, they're not trained uh, like that to be a learner first and an educator, educator second. So it's really something that has to change in the head and I think this is why it's so necessary to be networked and to get help and uh, support from each other. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I think it's great. We can sit here um, and listen to someone from Germany who is sharing her perspective around this idea of being a learner first and an educator second. And it's really a poster child example of the way that if we allow ourselves and humble ourselves and we're willing to learn from other people, there's a great deal out there that we can learn and that we that'll help to switch us and change us into um, this this connected educator. So I love this precept that was brought out in the, in the manifesto. It said, community is built through the co-construction of knowledge. And it actually, this uh, statement is very heavily supported. I know Mitch Resnick and others have done some work where they say that if you want to, to have, create an online space, you can create it. But just because you build it doesn't mean anybody's going to come. You can create a blog, and if you're talking at people all the time, not a lot of people are going to participate with you there. But that if you really want to build community, the kind of community where I learn from you and you learn from me, and that we're collaborative in that, not cooperative, then you've got to do co-construction of knowledge. You've got to build things together. Now, some people push back on this, and some people say, well, knowledge building is a very personal thing. It's a, it's a very individualized thing, and it's based on the schema and the experiences that I've had. But if you look at social learning theory, you're going to see that we are social beings. And while we construct knowledge very personally, and, and now that we have these ubiquitous tools, we've become techno-constructivists almost, where we're listening to the ideas of others, and that is shaping who I have become. You know, Tennyson says that, you know, we're, we're each a part of uh, all those that we've met, all those that we've been around, and all those that we've been exposed to. So looking at this and looking at some of the uh, statements underneath it, Anybody want to weigh in? What do you think about this idea that community is built through the co-construction of knowledge? Jackie, what do you think about that? I don't know how else we'd learn, seriously. I, I think that's, that's it, if you look historically, we built, we built upon historically the pieces from past Socrates and Plato. Everybody's built upon the knowledge of previous folks, and now we could just it's so, the geometric progression now, because we could share things online, I mean, I've heard um, folks speak that now it becomes our responsibility to share knowledge online and then allow others to uh, play with it like clay and sculpt it into their own setting and their own, their own construction and then pass it on to the next person. And boy, do we get a, a unique product when we're able to do that. I agree with you. I think that um, that it is a very powerful learning experience, not only for the community, the sense of community and the sense of trust and the sense of appreciation, honor that comes out of that, but it's also a very much a, a empowering for ourselves. You know, I really like this. So the power of connections leads to collective efficacy, collective wisdom, and long-standing collective intelligence. So. 
in the beginning, I'm building self-efficacy. I'm speaking out. I'm blogging. I'm grabbing the mic, and, and I'm becoming more confident in who I am as a teacher leader or as, an, as someone in a position of formal leadership. But then what happens is when I start to build and co-construct and build on your ideas and listen to what you have to say, there starts to come this collective efficacy where as a group we become empowered, uh, that no one gives us the power. We, are, we, are, we enable ourselves through that connection to truly gain a collective sort of empowerment. Collective wisdom starts to grow, and then over time we have this legacy of collective intelligence that we've kind of created together. You know, I love this. Connected learners talk to strangers. You know, Will Richardson says all the time, talk to strangers. You know, break that rule. Teach your kids to talk to strangers. And everybody sort of shocked when he says it. But the truth is, is that you don't have to know intimately who you're co-learning with, co-constructing with. Uh, Lonnie Ritter Hall, who is the co-author of the book that I wrote, The Connected Educator, we never met except one time, and it was for a very short amount of time. We didn't even talk in Skype that much. We just started co-constructing inside these Google Docs and thinking this book through. And, and um, K-12 Online, which is an online conference for educators by educators, uh, it's getting ready to kick off again in October. You should participate. It's another great online conference. Darren Carpato and I uh, talked about that idea, brought it to fruition, brought other people in. Wes Fryer has taken it over. Dean Cheresky was involved. And then that, and we, Darren and I never met. We never met a single time until just recently and long after we're done with that conference. So, Valerie, what do you think about all this, this idea that community is built through the co-construction of knowledge? I just wanted to throw out this idea which of a United Nations of Education. And it's something that I've I've read about and that the idea of co constructing the knowledge that we need to lead the world towards peace and sustainability, all of these issues that face us, that that teachers can model that kind of discussion that needs to happen that isn't happening because of the issues that involve current political situations and power blocks. So, you know, I, that's one way that I'm envisioning this, op, this possibility of connected learning. I really love that, and I love the idea of modeling, too. There's a slide in a minute that talks about how we need to do that with our students. I guess the last point I'll drive home on here is, do you know what who you know knows? You know, it used to be that we, it was who we knew, it was what we knew. We'd memorize facts, we'd take these standardized tests, we'd do well, and we'd go forth and be told that, you know, we could do great things. And then it became not what we knew, you know, especially as technology became more and more ubiquitous. Uh, Tony um, Wagner talks about that if you, there's no competitive advantage. You can mute your mic just a minute, I'll let you have it as soon as I get done that there really is no competitive advantage to knowing more than the person sitting next to you when we both can Google stuff, you know. So, it, so it's not what you know, but then it became who you know and how are you going to leverage those people. Well, just knowing someone isn't really going to do you any good. In the 21st century, it's really more about do you know what who you know knows. If I know Valerie is connected to First Nations, if I know that um, I think it's Judy as is thinking about this, about democratic kinds of social justice issues and really looking at human issues. If I know how, who knows what, then I'll be able to leverage them. So in connected learning, this community built through co-construction of knowledge, has a lot to do with being able to leverage the wisdom of each other. Okay, so Judy, you want to grab the mic? Um, yeah, it's Judith Comfort in Vancouver again. Um, I think one of the things that bothers me about uh, all this talk is that it's an extremely materialistic approach to, to learning. And it's not about learning facts and spitting out facts and sharing with other people and stuff. It really is about the human imagination and the spiritual uh, component. And, um, and, and, and mankind has always had that. It's just, you know, because we are... Um, you know, it's kind of coming, being communicated in a different way. I don't see that we can really take credit for this huge um, thing. I, I, I know I'm sounding big, and I don't mean to do that, but um, I just, I just think we should, we need to, um, to uh, look at this in a, in a more of a, uh, a historical perspective. And I said, I said that again. So thank you very much for listening. And I am going to listen even more deeply. If you want to lay some of that out in the chat, I would love to look more closely at that and uh, 
Obviously, a one-hour webinar doesn't really allow us time to do that, but I would love for you to, to kind of lay some of those ideas out in the chat so that I can make sure I understand. So I did want to say that, you know, when we're thinking about this idea of co-constructed uh, ideas builds community, um, I, there's this idea of professional learning community. Smile at me or give me a thumbs up or say yes inside the, uh, the chat window if you're one of those folks that um, you've got PLCs going in your school and that's the way the school system is helping you to build community and doing those kinds of things. You know, i got to say to you that I don't think professional learning communities are enough. You know, I think it's the best help we have for schools as they currently exist, but I, we all know schools don't, it isn't all about how schools currently exist. Professional learning communities are done from top down. So what I'm going to propose is that we come up with a new strategy that we use something that what I'm going to be calling connected learning communities. And connected learning communities are really a combination, and that combination has to do with um, looking at face-to-face -face learning that happens in a professional learning community. It also has to do with personal learning networks and the building of those networks, uh, like what we're doing, connecting and doing these kinds of things. But then it takes it into a much deeper, more strategic place, uh, online communities of practice. To give you kind of a clearer idea, I pulled this chart from the book that I wrote, The Connected Educator, that really looks at these three prongs and the structure of each, you know, where professional learning communities are often done to teachers, personal learning networks are do-it-yourself, but they really don't go deep and, and make lasting kinds of changes where you and I are changing the world. But the communities of practice is where we organize it ourselves and we go a little bit deeper, more systemic. And I don't think any one of these by themselves is going to change the world. I don't think just by connecting on Twitter, just by having these conversations, that we're really going to see the kind of uh, deep change that we need to have. I do think that Twitter is part of the emancipation of teachers from the silos of their classrooms, from principals, from the silos of their offices. I do think we're finding each other and we're socializing and we're having professional conversations. But I don't know, I don't know what the so what of that is. I don't know if what we're really doing then is changing the world. And I, so that's why I think it's really going to take a much broader, a three-pronged approach, if you will where we have very purposeful face-to-face -face kinds of conversations around things that matter in our local context, that we also go and pick and choose people that we want to learn from in a very intentional way, that I go and follow people that, are, that whose ideas are going to inform what I'm doing in my professional practice at my school or my organization. But then I also then, out of that network, as Nancy White says, communities fall, and I'm able to to gather together with an intimate group of people who I know what they know, and together we bring the best pedagogy, the best ideas that we have to the table, and we come up with really exciting things. So I'm going to give the mic to um, Rehab uh, and see uh, what they have to say, but then I also want you to think about in chat, if you will, what communities and networks do you belong to, and how are they helping you to learn in a connected way? So I'm going to give up the mic and uh, see what Rajab, Rehab Rajab has to say. And I'm sorry if I totally botched your name. So to all you have to do is grab the mic. It's in the top left. I see you have your hand up, and uh, we'll hear what you have to say. So can you hear me now? Okay, I could hear you, but somebody else had the mic, so I wasn't able to tell you that. If you'll just let go of the mic, I'm going to give it to her, and then that way I can respond to her if I need to. But we can hear you fine. So you can grab it now. Uh, so I just want to say that um, building these personal learning networks really empower teachers. So they do make a difference. Um, on an individual level, but also for the communities. Um, let's not forget that building a personal learning network online is the best way um, to, for professional development on a budget, on a, on a shoestring, when people don't have a lot of money to spend on their professional development. Um, it doesn't only allow you to find the like-minded people, but also find new things that you've never heard about. So not only expand your knowledge in your domain, but uh, find what you should be looking for, not just what you're looking for. 
that's all I wanted to say. Kristen, if you can help me watch for Mike so that if there's two that have got it, then uh, you can help me deselect them. So I heard what you said, and I thought about that a lot, actually, in the book that I wrote. And one of the things that I found, and I think this graphic explains it perfect, is that networks where I'm finding people on Twitter and I'm reading their blogs or I'm following people and I'm having conversations and webinars are really very me-centered. They're about, about me. They're about who do I want to follow, who do I want to cherry pick, what do I want to learn from these people. And then community, I don't necessarily pick them. Community is a lot like family, and so I'm given my community, and together we uh, build and construct something. And communities are very much about the collective, the we, the collective efficacy, where networks can be about enabling myself or my students to become empowered, and are very much about the me. I totally agree with you that you need to use networks so that you go out, you find great ideas and information, and then you bring it back to the community and you help to make the none of us is as good as all of us kind of concept because you're using what you learn to inform uh, what's going on. You know, it used to be that this is the kind of network we had. I love this graphic. This came from Alex Karos, and uh, it was part of his dissertation. And this is very old school. This is, this is how a network used to work for a teacher. And the teacher was at the center of the network. But in a connected learning community and the way that we're building community through connections and conversations, it's very scaffold. It's a three-pronged approach. It's using three different layers, not one, all three at the same time, back and forth and, and all over in a very scaffold, uh, nonlinear kind of approach to learning. Howard Rheingold, one of my favorite authors, says that, you know, it's really understanding this idea of networks and how it all works is going to be one of the most important things in the 21st century. You know, and Seth Godin takes it and says that it's actually a building of a tribe, that by finding people that you can learn with and finding very diverse people that you can learn with is what's going to be the, the seedbed of true innovation, that when you're learning together with lots of different minds and lots of different ideas, then out of that is going to come some true innovation. It's a great book by Johansson called The Medici Effect that talks about this very thing, that if you took like-minded people, like all educators, all, you know, shipbuilders, and you had them try to solve a problem, they were going to be limited. But if you brought people with very different ge uh, ge geography, very different culture, very different ideology, very different politics, very different um, kinds of life experiences together, out of that could come real innovation. I also love this idea that Oldenburg talks about the third new place. And I've seen, I saw on uh, Teachers Teaching Teachers the other day that they, they were talking about this very thing. Um, and it's a neat concept. It's a place that we're, instead of the pub, where we all go down to the pub and uh, meet up in the evening and discuss, you know, how to change the world, it's uh, we're finding that we're doing it online. So this idea of diversity, let's talk about that a little bit. How healthy is it? to um, bring a great deal of different kinds of ideas together into uh, your network space. When you're building your network, if I was to, to look at who you follow on Twitter, is it going to be mostly people like you? Is it going to be lots of different kinds of people? And uh, you can sort of look at the ideas that are represented here that were in the manifesto, and I'd love to get your input. Kristen, what do you think about this idea of diversity? Or anybody else that would like to grab the mic? Kristen Dodd, anybody that's in the room? What do you think about diversity? Um, Shambles, I know that you're, you, you live out of the country. Maybe you'll grab the mic. Or Peggy George, you've done a lot of thinking around this. How is having a diverse network a good thing? And Judy, if you want to go first. Okay, it's a question about um, in crowd and out crowd. And and uh, diversity is about seeing uh, people that aren't in your crowd. However, if you don't, Identify with a group of people um, and put up some barriers to others, then you then you're in trouble as well. But um, I guess what I was speaking about in my and I brought up the issue of diversity is that I have followed um, uh, so much of the talk, which is which is um, uh, I put iPad good, people don't have iPads bad. Um, uh, the kind of the, the worshippers of the of the you know you say there's no such thing as experts, but the people who follow the, the Howard Rheingold or the you know the superheroes and everything everything. I, I, I've been following uh, Twitter. I've been following a thousand people on Twitter just because I'm looking for a kind of sense of ideas. And um, I, I think it's, it's it's diversity is essential to the health of our communities. And 
Um, having too many followers is, is not necessarily a good way. Uh, you know, voting by popularity is not necessarily um, a good thing. It's this side of, of uh, and crowdsourcing. It's just this side of, of uh, danger of the crowd taking over. So um, the question to me as a librarian is always how do we bring the absolute best ideas to the people when they need it. And in, in our case now, uh, when people are so closed down, so overwhelmed, um, how do we bring the, the new the nuanced and the intelligence and that kind of thing? I mean, it's a huge, huge challenge, but a diversity of health as far as I'm concerned. So thank you for listening. And thank you, Judy. You bring up some great points. First of all, I do want you to know that, you know, I talked, you, I think you said that I, and maybe I misunderstood that there weren't experts. I do believe that people have expertise. I think Malcolm Gladwell talks about that if you have 10,000 hours invested in something, you gain a great deal of expertise. I, I also believe that some, that there's lots of people who have lots of knowledge and hours and experience around things who aren't transparently sharing. And because they aren't transparently sharing, because they're not Googleable, because I can't find them, I can't learn from them. And um, this idea of diversity, I, I don't think that we ought to just pick certain people that are popular. I don't, I don't want uh, the network to turn into high school, and I guess that's what I'm, what I'm trying to advocate here for. And I think what people advocated for in the, in the uh, Connected Manifesto, that instead what we need to do is we really need to find out what each other knows to get to know other people and to put people that are very different. I, I love what Heidi Hutchinson said here. She said, connected learners gain deep understanding through becoming more tolerant, empathetic, and are able to stretch themselves even further. You know, honor the learner and what they know. We, must, we believe we must seek out opinions different than our own. Being connected means we can ask questions and challenge our own thinking to broaden our perspectives and our understanding. Lori Hansen, you said utilize the strengths of others for the benefit of the group. Would you be willing to grab the mic and talk about that? Sure, I could do that. Thanks for asking. Uh, yeah, I just was commenting on that because you were talking about not turning into high school. And I think that sort of naturally we do also fall into certain roles when we do working groups. But it's important to understand and to remember that when we are working in a group or collaborating, that we're all trying to help one another. And I think that on Twitter especially, we can see that where um, people are just really always willing to share without any kind of a, a payment or payback for it. It's just for the good of for the good of the community. So I just I really appreciate that as a connected educator. And thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it too. So I'm just gonna, I, I wanna tell you that this, this just kind of in keeping with the same thing that we've been talking about, and Judy's gonna love this one. Where I'm really, where, when we're using the ideas of connections and leveraging those connections correctly, it's going to not only be about empowerment, and I'm not suggesting that anyone has power to give, but enabling people through these tools to become empowered, but it also is about social justice. It's all about democracy. It's all, it's about, I love what uh, Dreves Lipscomb says here, connected learning exemplifies social justice principles. Once you have equal access provided by basic skills, then comes individualized learning, results in relationships with desired experts and co-learners for expanding knowledge and skill, and it adds up to career and economic empowerment. So that by connecting, by helping your students connect with people that are uh, very different and learning from them, uh, then it, it changes things. I think it's a game changer. I think connected learning is going to change the way you learn, you as an individual. Connected learning is going to change the way you teach. And in the manifesto, this came out, that we have a responsibility to help our students understand this and understand how they're going to learn together and what it is that they need to be doing. See, the truth is, is that change is hard. It really is. To be able to learn and lead and teach in these kinds of ways is very difficult. And uh, by ourselves, it's almost impossible to make the kinds of changes that are being asked of us. But when you're a connected educator, when you're connected to other learners, when you're doing that three-pronged approach, you're connected to people in your building, you're connected to people on Twitter and in a network capacity, and then you, from a very informed, purposeful way, gather what you learn there and bring it back to your to your face-to-face -face community and bring it to your online community of inquiry, and you're making deep kinds of connections and you're having collegial kinds of conversations, and you become more effective. That change is easier. 
See, admit it. You are an agent of change. You always have been one. You have made incredible links in the kids that you've worked with, with the adult learners that you've worked with. The difference is, is now we have the tools to be able to leverage our ideas. Now we can actually make things happen through the connections that we make with other people. In an era of massive change, an effective agent isn't afraid. They're bold. So I just want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to take risks. I want to ask, are you willing to risk change? Are you willing to reach out and help other people? Are you willing to get to know what other people know? Can you accept the fact that change is, has a big, hairy seed, not a small, neat, little, tight face seed, and that sometimes it's a really messy process, and it's going to require some ambiguity. It's going to require some tough conversations. It's going to require us disagreeing with each other in a very respectful, collegial way. See, we're the last generation, you and me, the 63 of us in this room, we're the last generation of educators who have really been given the prerogative to decide whether or not we wanted to embrace the change. But the truth is, is that the young men and women that are in our classrooms, the ones who are experiencing uh, connected learning and learning how to find and safely vet other people in the safety net of what we do in our schools, they're not going to have that prerogative. But if they don't connect with each other, if they don't find each other, if they don't understand how to, that it's about not who you know or what you know, but do you know what who you know knows, if they don't know digital literacies, if they don't understand uh, how to build a personal learning network with subject matter experts around the world, then they're going to be at a, at a loss because the, it's true, the truth is, is that affluent kids will get what they need, their parents will make sure, but the kids that are going to need these literacies to be able to do jobs and work around the world and collaborate with people in other countries that they've never met, that they aren't going to get these unless they get them in the safety net of your classroom at school. So I, I just want to encourage you to, um, to connect with other people. I want to encourage you to go teach other people that don't know how. I also wanted to tell you that we're having a book club. Uh, Connected Educator Month has taken my book, and we're discussing these ideas and more inside the book club. Uh, if, you're a, if you're one of the book club people, I hope that you'll uh, give it a shout out there in the chat so other people will know to come. I put the links in just a few minutes ago. You can scroll up and we'd love for you to join. I'd also love for you to find this in Powerful Learning and Practice. We have these conversations all the time too. Um, become a PLP. Thank you so much for having me today. I appreciate it. I'm going to cut off the recording. I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes if anybody wants to talk. But um, thanks for sharing your learning with me. I learned a lot. See you later.